Welcome back. Today we're very lucky to be here in the Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism and joined by Rebecca Sklut, who is a visiting writer in residence here. And Rebecca, of course, is the author of the best-selling and award-winning book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. And it's no exaggeration to say that this is the most important book written for a public audience in the history of bioethics. So we're incredibly lucky to be joined by her today. Welcome, Rebecca. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So Rebecca, I know you've been asked this many times, and of course, everybody should read this wonderful book. But can you give us the short form story of Henrietta Lacks and the HeLa cells? Yeah, absolutely. So where I always like to start is just with HeLa. So the word HeLa is spelled H-E-L-A, and it's an abbreviation for Henrietta's name, H-E for Henrietta, L-A for Lacks. And Henrietta was a poor black tobacco farmer who grew up in Southern Virginia. And in 1951, when she was 30 years old, she was diagnosed with cervical cancer. At this point, she had moved up to Baltimore and she went to Johns Hopkins, which was the only hospital where she could actually get treated because she was a black woman. And this was this you know, era of segregation. So she was seen in what's called the public ward, which was where you went if you were black or poor and you couldn't afford to be treated anywhere else. So she went to Hopkins and before treating her cancer, without telling her, her doctor just cut a little piece of her tumor and put that in a dish. And he sent that down the hall to George Guy who was the head of tissue culture research at Hopkins. And George Guy, along with scientists all around the world, had been trying to grow human cells outside the body for decades, and it had never worked. They could survive a few days, maybe a few weeks, but they all died pretty quickly. And for reasons that remained a mystery for decades, Henrietta's cells just never died. So they pretty quickly just started exploding. They doubled their numbers every 24 hours. And they went from like two dishes to four to eight to 16, and they sort of pretty quickly took over the lab. And when George Guy realized this, he started calling all these scientists and saying, I think I have the first immortal human cell line, which is what they're called, which means they will just grow and divide forever in the lab, as long as you keep them warm and you feed them and keep them clean. In response, all these scientists said, great, can we have some? And he said yes. And so he would send these cells to other scientists who would then grow them in their lab and give them to their friends, who'd give them to their friends. And Henrietta's cells spread around the world this way. Very inefficient system for doing this. And so pretty quickly, these facilities were set up for mass producing her cells. So these giant industrial sized vats of culture medium, which is what you feed cells, assembly lines for putting them into dishes. And her cells were grown to the tune of about six trillion cells a week and sent out to laboratories around the world. So the volume of cells that grew from this one little tiny sample is sort of inconceivable. One scientist estimated that if you could have saved them all and put them on a scale, that by today they'd weigh more than 50 million metric tons. And individual cells weigh almost nothing. So it's just, it's so hard to wrap your mind around how many cells that is. And they really changed science. They were one of the most important things that happened to medicine. They very quickly were used to help develop the polio vaccine. They went up in the first space missions to see what would happen to human cells in zero gravity. Her cells were the first ever cloned. Her genes were some of the first ever mapped. They were used to create some of our most important cancer medications like vincristine and tamoxifen. The HPV vaccine we have thanks to her cells. In vitro fertilization, a lot of the technology for that was developed using her cells. The list just goes on and on. And Henrietta had no idea that the cells were out there. And part of what made them so valuable for science was that they grew with this intensity and they did the same thing in her body. So her initial tumor, which was about the size of a nickel, spread to almost every organ in her body within just a few months. And she died just after her 31st birthday. And she left five kids behind. They didn't know anything about the cells, neither did her husband. And they just sort of went on with their lives. They lived in poverty in East Baltimore. They lived pretty difficult lives. And they just never heard anything about the cells until the 1970s. So you know, flash forward a few decades, and these were the early days of gene mapping. And one scientist, Victor McCusick, who's sort of known as the grandfather of the Human Genome Project, he was this incredible geneticist at Hopkins, he decided to track down Henrietta's kids because he thought if he could get some samples of their DNA, then he could essentially test their DNA and use that to learn more about HeLa cells. So he sent a postdoc to call Henrietta's husband one day. 
And Henrietta's husband had a fourth grade education. He didn't know what a cell was. And the way he understood this phone call was essentially, we've got your wife, like she's alive in a laboratory, part of her's alive in a laboratory. We've been doing research on her for the last 25 years. And now we have to test your kids to see if they have the cancer that killed her. None of which was what the scientist said at all. She said, we want to look at your kids' HLA markers and compare those to the HeLa cells. I mean, things that most people wouldn't have understood. And his reference point, the only cell he'd ever heard of was like a prison cell. So he was like, so they have part of her or some of her in a cell, like a prison cell. And part of what happened in that moment was that just linguistically, he and the scientist didn't understand each other. There was a sort of enormous communication breakdown. She was from China. She hadn't been in the US very long, she had a very thick accent. And David Lax came from Southern Virginia. He spoke with a very thick accent that his kids referred to as the country mumble. And he was just like, oh, it was a, yeah. And it was very hard to understand him until you got used to talking to him. So they just sort of literally didn't understand each other, but also, you know, they spoke different languages in terms of science and not science. He really didn't have the basic science education to understand what she was saying, and she didn't realize that. So she was very well-intentioned. She was excited to talk to him. She thought HeLa cells were amazing, and Henrietta was famous. And, but it was just this moment of complete communication misfire. So what he heard was, we have to test your kids to see if they have cancer. And for Henrietta's kids, particularly her daughter, this was terrifying. So her daughter was nearing her 30th birthday. This is Deborah Lax. And she'd sort of lived her life in fear of turning 30 because she knew her mother died then, didn't know why. So for her, these scientists coming at this point seemed like it confirmed her worst fears. So the scientists would come to the house and take samples. And Deborah was this mixture of terrified about finding out she had cancer, but also very excited because she thought maybe these people can tell her about her mother because she was a toddler when her mom died and no one ever really talked about her. So the scientists would come to the house and take these samples and Deborah would say things like, can you look in these bits of my mother that you have growing and tell me what her favorite color was mm. and whether she liked to dance and if she breastfed me. And she was also very worried that her mother might somehow be feeling pain because of this research. So she would as the scientists sort of tried to explain some of the research to her, she would say things like, if you're shooting these bits of my mother up to the moon and injecting them with these chemicals, does that somehow hurt her in the afterlife? Can she rest in peace if you're doing that? And she heard something about polio research and sort of imagined her mother's spirit experiencing all the physical pain of polio in the afterlife. And so she was really worried that she needed to protect her mother. And she would ask the scientists these questions and they just had no idea how to respond to her. One of them gave her a medical school genetics textbook and just sort of said, here, read this. This will tell you what you need to know about your mother, which it didn't. And this went on for years and pretty soon scientists started hearing someone has access to Gila's kids and can I have samples of their cells and DNA too? And so pretty soon their cells started being sent out to scientists around the world just like HeLa cells had. Pretty soon her sons figured out that people were buying and selling these cells and that in addition to all the important science that happened using them, that they really launched a multi-billion dollar industry. So many of the most important biotech companies that are now out there are sort of supplying genes and cells and you know, patenting genes and all those things started off as this very small company that just started selling HeLa cells. And when they found that out, they started saying, you know, so if people are buying and selling these things, essentially, where's our cut? And if our mother's cells were so important to medicine, why can't we go to the doctor? Why don't we get access to the medical care that her cells helped create? And no one had a very good answer to that question for them. And that, in a sense, had kept going for many years after that.